Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is TJ Kelly. I will be your moderator for today's discussion. And today's topic, as Raquel mentioned, is enterprise mail security, critical risks, and practical solutions. Joining us to discuss this topic is our panel of experts. First, we'll hear from Mr. Will Plummer, our CSO. Will is a 25-year U.S. Army veteran and explosives ordnance disposal expert. Will's topic today is to highlight the problem. He'll discuss the prevalence of mail threats and the risks and costs associated with each. After Will takes us through the problem, we'll then turn to the solution, hearing from Mr. Cody Martin, our Director of Mail Security. Cody is a former U.S. Postal Inspection Service federal agent with 12 years in Dangerous Mail Inspections Unit. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Alexander Sapok. Alex holds an MS and PhD degree in mechanical engineering from MIT and previously founded an MIT spin-out company in the field of advanced sensing. Alex will discuss the latest technology and science in security screening. Before we dive in, a quick introduction to who we are. Race Secure is a world leader in mail security, headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are experts in mail threat detection and real-time analysis and support. As the new standard in mail security, we support Fortune 500 companies, governments around the world, heads of state, and high-profile individuals. Briefly, here's a snapshot of our agenda today. We'll cover mailborne threats and their prevalence and costs, risk assessment, evaluating organizational risk profiles, and prevention with the newest technology for mail screening. We will have time for Q&A at the end, so please do feel free to submit questions into the Q&A box, and we will get to them at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, and lastly, as we go through today's discussion, each of our experts will refer back to what we call the five pillars of mail security. You can see them highlighted here. They are people, procedures, training, technology, and emergency response. And so without further ado, we'll bring in Will Plummer, our CSO, to take us through mailborne threats, the types of dangerous mail, and the extent of the problem. And now I'll turn it over to Will. Thank you, TJ. Uh, really, really appreciate it. So I'm going to take uh, number one and number five for a couple reasons. One, uh, human beings, people, we lean into them heavily, and they have an interaction with threats on a daily basis. So both on the individuals that send stuff and the individuals that have to, to manage and mitigate the risk. And then we tie that with the, uh, with the emergency response, that's where all the problems lie. So that's where the friction sits, and we're going to deal with it. The other three sections cover how to deal with it. We talk about the problem itself. So on top of what the numbers have here, uh, we collected our own stats for 2020. And um, is there, the stats themselves kind of stand alone, but they stand with different numbers depending upon which organization you're talking to. So... If you look at USPIS numbers, they show 3,289 suspicious incidents. If you look at the U.S. Bomb Data Center, they show 7,400. Yes, they're different years. We're waiting for a report to come in, but the numbers vary based on what the organization is looking at vice what they interact with. So, for example, USPIS, they're going to deal with just their mail. They're not going to see things that would come through FedEx or UPS, for example. All right. So... The crux of the problem that most people deal with nowadays is small threats. They show up because they have uh, no requirement for a chain of custody. Nobody has to produce them to present themselves to a the counter or have an account. You can get some stamps, drop it in the collection bin, and it's on the way. Um, the size that the USPS accepts is a half an inch thick and less than 10 ounces. That's the size that is stamp, address, addressee, and kick it in, it goes through the system. If it's larger than that, it's kicked back. If the person that's mailed to is the same as the return address, it's usually kicked back or destroyed. But uh, that falls the, the majority of where the threats lie. That's where the numbers fall. So with all this, we have to look at where what shows up. White powder events are on the rise. 38% last year was a 17% increase from the year before. Um, these threats happen because it's something that somebody can send into the organization and cause a major response. That's because you have to handle the situation as if it's the worst case. Um, if anthrax happened in 2001, we haven't seen a legitimate threat since like that, but you have to treat everyone as if it is. Uh, Dr. Fauci was, came out on a report two weekends ago and said, I opened a white powder letter up, hit myself in the face. If it had been anthrax, I could take Cipro for 30 days, I'm okay. If it's rice, and I'm dead. It was the Washington Post and everywhere else. Um, so that's the threat that everybody's looking at nowadays. 
Uh, the targets, 42% of the government, we pulled out courts and corrections because those increased for two different reasons. Courts increased because judges were primarily being targeted or courthouses themselves. And corrections were increased because of illicit items, illicit drugs. Um, mail threats increased collectively because people stopped going to see people face to face and you can still reach out and cause a, a negative outcome through the mail. Approximately 10 dangerous mail incidents happen every day. Uh, our collection is open source. Uh, sizes, the containers are broke down on the left, primarily 63% parcels, 32% letters. The rest are unreported. The interesting thing on this is the, is the response. Who shows up? So all the white powder events you're gonna have, hazmat teams are gonna show up. If something's caustic or anybody has a negative reaction, you're, you're gonna end up with a hazmat team generally. Uh, the bomb squad EOD stuff, that's generally, those numbers are about the same. We did see an increase in the Postal Service inspection and with the FBI. That's because a lot of incidents this year were tied to either federal crimes or things across state lines. And a lot of incidents have gone back to the Postal Service and they've increased their inspection and their uh, response. So the first thing that we're gonna cover is a case study. So this, when last year, Subway was hit with a white powder threat in their corporate headquarters in Connecticut. Uh, just general background on the company, they have approximately 200 employees that work in the headquarters. There was only 20 on site the day that it happened, and it was really a non-incident. The local news caught wind of it, and they showed up and reported. Uh, Subway reacted appropriately. Everybody was decontaminated. There was no threat, but they handled all their steps. All the procedures went as expected, and uh, it was eventually, throughout the 20, next 24 hours, it was a, a non-event, no story. What ended up happening was other news agencies leaned in and started looking at it and said, hey, Subway's a known name. We have something that we can highlight here. Um, they start trying to figure out their own reasons. They put it to the local firing. So they laid off 600 people from corporate headquarters. Okay, they, so the, the local news is what said, identified that. Uh, they brought up recent problems like Jared Fogle in that incident. And essentially the news agencies blame the corporate headquarters for actions that some other perpetrator did. Um, this happens every day, and it's the outcome that the perpetrator wanted. That's exactly what they wanted to have happen, and that's exactly what happened. All right. Um, this year saw a very contentious election, and we'll talk about some election threats in a second. But uh, the White House, every administration has received rice and threats since 2003. It happens every several years. It's very common. Um, this particular threat showed up in, this, in September. The individual is a French-Canadian and basically sent blatant threats to the White House, six uh, letters that went into detention facilities and law enforcement headquarters in Texas because there was some interaction in that state based on her family history. Um, she sent and was caught at the border, in fact, armed and met every single reason this person was questionable, she carried it all. I mean, look at the tweet on the bottom right corner. I'm not gonna read it, but you get the gist of what, what her thought process was. Uh, the letter that she sent was aggressive as well. We'll send these slides out like we do every time so you can read the letter. I'm not going to go through and kind of beat up English a little bit, but it's it's fairly aggressive. So the government's been getting hit heavily. Uh, election this year, like I said a second ago, was very contentious. Multiple cities were hit. These are some highlights of, of larger incidents over the last 12 months. Primarily, it was Board of Elections and primarily white powder threats to shut people down. The um, Baltimore, Maryland, NAACP was white powder, and it was also a racist note that was that was sent through, and it was also an election facility. The, um, the one that stands out here is the one that happened in Grand Islands, Nebraska. So this was a trial. This was somebody sending something in. They had the intent of running a dry run. Did this get in? Can I cause something to have hap to negative to happen? And then... What can I do with it in two to four, six weeks when the election is actually going on? All these individuals were captured. Uh, if you start making federal uh, authorities aware of your activities, you're going to get some attention, and that's what happened. Uh, the pictures on the right are ones that one of our clients sent to us that was worried about screening throughout their local area, and somebody just happened to put a pin in, in uh, the ballot and seal it, and they mailed it that way. Weird things happen, but it's, it's not always going to be uh, something hazardous. So this year we saw an interesting experience that the Netherlands had. Uh, 20 plus parcels were sent throughout the, the country with the multiple cities, multiple headquarters for companies and government agencies. It was essentially an extortion for Bitcoin. 
Some were live devices, some were incendiary, some were just hoaxes and threats. All of them were tied to, were generally tied together. Nobody was ever identified. So the individual that uh, sent these wasn't identified. Like I said, there was no DNA. They did quite a good job for forensic protection for themselves. One of them did interact with a, with a uh, person screening. It did start hissing. The individual threw it. It essentially low ordered on the floor when it landed. But uh, so there were literal live devices. All 50 states and multiple countries in the last year saw a brushing scam go through. So this was, it's an e-commerce event, but it causes a lot of problems. And then I'll show you a picture in a minute that gets after my point. It's meant for fake e-commerce reviews. So they send something to say me that costs 20 cents. That opens up a legitimate transaction. That transaction means that they can now legitimately put a comment up as me and I've now reviewed something and it's pushed their stars up. Um, that is money for them. Cheap events, they end up with marketing from it. It is a violation of the Federal Trade Commission and it's very rarely ever uh, prosecuted. It doesn't happen very often. This hit in such a large number that everybody reacted. There was responses from the Federal Trade, responses from the DEA, from DEA, from the Agriculture Department. All of them responded for something. Local cities were trying to tell people, please don't plant these seeds, we don't know what they are. And lo and behold, some people planted them. The problem with these is that they start showing up and they follow all the marking of suspect packages. They look like a suspect package, they're marked like one, and people reacted like one, as they should, as you expect to. It's from China, it's from overseas, it's not to you, it doesn't make sense. And it ends up sitting on a grill like the front door of this place and it gets called in and wastes government, wastes first responders time and energy. It, it did do a large amount of draining of emergency services over the summer. One thing that's creeping up in uh, the world of e-commerce nowadays is the last mile. There's a huge amount of competition to get the last bit of, uh, let's say, package transfer or personal information, whatever it is, the last bit of, of transfer of that piece of mail to the front door of the office or the, the house that it's headed to. What that leaves is people that aren't necessarily always representing the organization that sent it. So Amazon drivers drive the trucks that we've all seen. They wear purple vests. You see them walk up to the house, take out a cell phone, take a picture of your front doorstep, and you get an alert that says, hey, your package is there. Oftentimes now, it's not that driver. It's last minute, especially with the USPS overrun that they've had the last year with their packages. It's private people in their private car showing up to your house and walking up to your doorstep. There was an individual this year that was hurt with a style of threat, in Baltimore, uh, late summer. Uh, last mile threat was placed on the front door. Grandmother picked it up, put it in the house, threw it on the kitchen table. The target had been working all day long, came home at five o'clock at night, took the package in his room, opened the package in, had a detonation in his lap, severely injuring his legs. Um, that is a threat. Nobody validated that. There's no chain of custody. It just shows up and then you have to mitigate the problem that's now on your front porch. Uh, this came up late 2019 and, and it's becoming more of a threat that companies are looking at. Uh, Black Hat research came out and showed basically what is called war shipping. So you take a electronic device that has a signature, the ability to, to listen, to pick up packets of information, and you ship it inside of a major corporate corporation. Uh, it gets in there, sits, effectively listens, wakes up when it hears something and then transmit to another receiver outside of the facility, whether that's passwords, raw information, pictures, whatever's flowing around uh, wirelessly. A couple ways you can stop this if you think you're being targeted is process all your mail quickly. Don't leave anything sitting. Scan for anomalies, obviously, uh, and then discard packing. Everything should make sense and it should be there for a reason. If you've got a bunch of stuff just sitting around and it could be removed out of the area, do so. Make sure you're protecting yourself and your people. Uh, this is the last slide I'll cover and, and this is just a generic statement. The probability of something happening is conversely related to the severity of the incident. So false positives, they happen all the time. They happen every day. They're not severe. Uh, there's nothing that happens in that scenario that is overwhelming unless people don't have a way to respond. They don't have emergency response procedures in place. As you walk down that, that threat, you end up with hoaxes. Those are meant to look a little aggressive. They're meant to do something and get a reaction. But again, they're hoax. They're not going to physically hurt anybody. Chemical incidents where you end up with mercury or other hazardous materials being moved around, 
people building devices, and then you work your way to biological threats like ricin or anthrax. Um, those are legitimate threats. The pro probability is a lot lower, but those threats themselves have an extremely high severity related to them. So it's really important to focus on training and focus on your facilities and focus on your standard operating procedures and how you plan to mitigate them when they show up. TJ? Thank you, Will. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Thank you for all those submitting those questions. We will get back to them uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, before we uh, do that, let's move on to our next section here. We'll talk about mail security programs, key concepts, and implementation, and we'll bring in our Director of Mail Security, Mr. Cody Martin. Cody. Yep, thanks, TJ. Um, as you're going to hear repeatedly over the course of this presentation, we're really focusing on the five pillars of mail security. And uh, with that in mind, we, we, we believe that those should be um, something that should be comprehensive, right? We want to make sure that we have all of the pillars in place. We want to make sure that they're robust. And, you know, as we've said before, that's, that includes people, SOPs, training, technology, and emergency response. And when we effectively combine these pillars, we end up with a program that really elevates your security posture against the often overlooked mailborne threats. And that's the gap that we're really trying to fill with a mail security program. The first pillar we want to highlight, again, is people. And I typically split this into internal teams and external teams. Your internal teams are going to consist of everyone from the frontline worker all the way up to uh, the top level executive. These external teams, you know, these folks and, and everyone in between really is what, are what is going to make the program, uh, you know, something that's worthwhile internally. Everybody has to be bought in and they have to see that from the various levels, right? The external teams are the individuals that you partner with outside your organization who provide expert support that is not always available within the organization. So this may be uh, some subject matter experts, some um, incident response folks. It's basically, um, people you can lean on uh, during these incidents and get some outside resources. And what we're looking for is a coordinated effort between these two components that really tie this people element together. So after people, we have procedures, and this is what I primarily focus a lot of my time on. Uh, your SOPs are really critical in dealing with mailborne threats. They're gonna help set policy. They're gonna help set standards and training. They're gonna establish screening processes. They're gonna provide guidelines for how you deal with suspicious items and a whole lot more. You know, when you're looking at this, you need to ask yourself, you know, what is your current screening process? Are there procedures outlined to address suspicious items internally? Do you have those things set up in place? Um, when it comes to emergency response, do you have options outside of simply calling first responders? Is that your first and only option? Um, is your program built in a way that can you know, accommodate multiple sites and multiple risk levels, things like that. You know, what if you have an executive protection component? Does your SOPs accommodate that as well? So really it's this type of preparation that helps maintain standards regardless of uh, your location or your situation. So now that we've got those set up, we wanna focus on training, right? Training's key when it comes to implementing your mail screening and security procedures. Um, the idea with training is that it needs to span all layers of the organization. It needs to educate. It needs to be measurable to confirm a certain level of understanding. And it needs to be continually updated and refreshed in order to address, you know, new and emerging or evolving threats that may be popping up. You know, for example, um, your training can be as simple as teaching people the process and protocols for an emergency response, or maybe even doing something like a tabletop exercise or a walkthrough on a scenario. Either way, this should continue to be an ongoing process that you're always looking at and evaluating. Technology is the next pillar we want to look at. And what I want to focus on here is really validating technology. And when you look at that, you know, you need to focus on what standards you're using. Some of you may have some standards in place based on who you work for or who you're involved with. Uh, other folks may not have to meet such requirements. You, you have a kind of more of an open uh, platform in order to to take a look at uh, various technology and implement that. Either way, you need to be sure that the equipment you're using is capable of accomplishing your specific tasks. So what problem are you addressing and does the equipment help you solve that problem in a consistent, validated way? And that's the main focus here. And then when, to sum it all up, and then the last pillar we're going to discuss is uh, response uh, 
emergency response plans. And the big takeaway here is that you need to plan for the response you want to have. And uh, that seems a little counterintuitive, but uh, what we're saying here is that there are elements that you can't control, right? And there are a lot of things that you can control. And it's those that we want to focus on. And that's where all these other pillars come into play. If you do not have an emergency plan in place, you should strongly consider getting one as soon as possible. Uh, if it needs to be updated, be sure that you're working on those things actively. You know, these documents mandate how threat is managed. It also guides the actions of everyone involved and helps them know what to do and when to do it. You know, the, one of the things to consider here is that these plans need to be prepared and rehearsed often uh, so they stay fresh, right? And, you know, for example, your, your response plan uh, should work through who you call and when you call them in terms of response. And you can see on the slide here and note the differences in the two agencies that have a res that are responding to a call. This could be a very similar incident in terms of, you know, maybe a suspicious or a white powder, but you're getting two totally different uh, responses. One is very low key, uh, no lights and sirens, nothing like that. And then one is obviously drawing a lot of attention, a lot of personnel, a lot of first responders there. Again, you could have the exact same call and get two totally different responses depending on who you're leaning on in those situations. So knowing who to call and when is very important. And what I'd like to say on this one is, you know, the situation, not a lack of preparation on your part should dictate who you call and when, right? So don't let that lack of preparation force you to call 911 immediately every single time. Okay, so we've talked about, um, the pillars and how they come together and what the program looks like. And now you probably want you need to think about, you know, where is your risk? Where does that lie? And how does all of that fit together? So let's talk about evaluating your risk. And when you start looking at your risk and how to assess it, you know, it's important to remember that your mail security solution is going to require flexibility. And that's just the bottom line. Um, you know, what if you're dealing with numerous sites, and each one has a different risk level. Um, you need to have a program that's scalable and allows you the flexibility to address the various uh, caveats that surround each site's risk profile, profile. And this is where it can get you know, a little bit tricky for larger organizations with a larger footprint. You know, with that in mind, um, and you start thinking about what your risk is, um, we have some things that help us out a little bit. And DHS has provided some guidance on this, and. Uh, a few things that we know for sure, regardless of where you sit as an entity, DHS recommends that all organizations within the public and private sector screen, uh, do visual screening, uh, do hook screening, and screening for dangerous contraband. So that's the smallest satellite office with two employees and no mailroom. Uh, they recommend that we should be screening those three ways, right? So on the other end of the spectrum, they've also highlighted some high-risk industries and you can see those highlighted here on the slide. So if you fall under any of these or, or under the umbrella of any of these industries, in addition to doing the visual and the hoax and the contraband screening, DHS recommends that you screen for explosives, biologicals, chemicals, radiation, nuclear, and other dangerous content. So the whole, full spectrum, right? So if your risk profile warrants that type of screening, those are the things that DHS recommends that you be uh, looking at. Now, the, the gray area falls in between those, right? So if you're not the extremely low risk, which you've identified, and if you know that you may not necessarily be high risk, where do you, where do you fall? How do you figure that out? And um, before we get into talking about that just a little, I just want to show this briefly, and we'll provide this to you to look at. This will help you maybe classify your uh, locations a little bit easier based on your risk level, uh, your uh, the size of it, you know, how many employees you have, what your mill volume is, and then you can cross-reference that with these mill screening best practices. And it's that gray area that we're going to kind of focus on to help you figure out which way you should shift your current screening if you do have that in place. So as you're working through that gray area, right, uh, a few things that we can look at in addition to uh, the things we've mentioned are some uh, additional considerations, I guess you could put it that way. Symbolism is uh, one that comes into play often. You know, are you a well-known or uh, a well-publicized entity? You know, are you in the news a lot? Do people know about you? Are you getting a lot of media attention? You know, if, is your organization the type that if it's attacked would have um, some widespread impact, right? If, if your attack would 
would that instill some sort of fear within the public or within your business partners or other organizations? Something to think about. A negative psychological impact can also be an issue. You know, if your organization is targeted or the recipient of a threat, what is that going to do to people uh, psychologically? Um, you know, there's a lot of, it happens a lot where there's a perception that all entities associated with an organization are at risk if a particular organization, you know, is succumb, succumbs to some sort of attack through the mail. So we want to try to avoid that if possible. Um, location is another one. You know, are you in a multi-tenant facility in a high urban or in an urban center with a large population, uh, which is highlighted on here as well? You know, you have a lot of employees there. Is it a really dense area of the city? All of these things can come into play when you're working through that risk assessment. So on top of those, there's some other intangibles that you want to look at. Um, and there's a wide range of these. And, and, you know, when you're working through kind of a robust assessment of your program, this is all uh, something you should look at. And there's a lot more to it, but I just want to hit on a few of these real quick. Um, you know, had there been previous attacks? And when I, I say this all the time to folks when, when I'm working with them, this doesn't mean a, a, a previous terrorist attack necessarily, right? Have you been receiving, you know, threatening letters? because often it starts there and then it escalates. Have you received you know, any hoaxes or white powders or uh, any other uh, mail-related threats? I would consider those previous attacks because you know, my personal experience and history has shown me that when actors don't get the response they want, they usually escalate their tactics, right? And they try something else to, to get their desired outcome. Um, you know, have there been other tenants in the building where you're at that have had or been the recipient of these sort of threats? That could be a factor that overflows into your organization as well. Um, has there been any demonstrations that have been organized or boycotts or labor disputes that affect your organization? Something else you want to consider, right? And then we can even get on to more, you know, uh, tangible things like physical layout of your, of your facility. Is it a single building? Are there multiple buildings? Are you at a campus? Is there a single tenant, multiple tenants? Like those things we've been mentioning earlier. Those are all things that you want to consider as you're working through this risk assessment to see which way you need to float on that scale. So we've looked at the pillars, right? We've looked at our risk and, and kind of how that's going to come uh, together as it relates to where we sit on that spectrum. And now we want to kind of focus on SOPs a little bit. And the big thing here is, you know, what problem are you trying to solve with your SOPs. And that's what you want to really drill into as you're looking at these. Um, this should be specifically addressed at the beginning of the document. You want to lay that out so it sets the tone for whatever you're trying to do. And the goal is to have an SOP that will work for every site globally and not just specific to an individual site. You don't want to rewrite this document for every single location that you're involved with. Um, however, if there are specific security measures relative to an individual site, they can be addressed we just handle that in a little bit different way. So what I like to look at it as, um, you know, at a minimum, all sites are expected to adhere to, adhere to the global uh, standards. And then any site-specific guidelines can be considered in addition to those standards. Um, so think about it that way when you're outlining your program. Make sure you have this broad document that applies globally. And then you can address any specifics as they come into play. Here is a, an example of what I'm, I was just talking about. Um, this outline kind of provides an overview of these building blocks that build up, you know, that, that kind of constitute your mail security program. Uh, when you get these established and when you work through your policy statement, the mail screening processes and procedures, maybe your e, EP uh, program, uh, your sus suspicious item screening, your emergency response, when you put all of that together, you're going to be able to come up with something that really um, applies globally. And then you can add on those site specifics, like I mentioned, uh, at a later time in the document to address any specific uh, security concerns at independent locations. And, you know, the, the idea here is that you want to uh, get this put together. It needs to be thorough. It needs to be easy to understand. And then when you roll this out, you know, you want to reinforce it by offering, you know, that training that we mentioned earlier you want to make sure people understand why what they're doing is important. That's, that's, a, that's a vital concept as well. Um, you want to make sure that you take a proactive role in developing a security first mindset that really works from the top down. And that's the idea that we focus on a lot of times with male security in particular. You know, when frontline personnel see upper management kind of engaged and bought into the security process, they're more likely to buy in 
to their importance and their role in this uh, program as well. So that's kind of the key that I've seen to successful implementation. So <clears throat> one of the resources that I, I steer people towards sometimes is um, BPATs or the best practices in anti-terrorism security. And you know, this first came out, you know, uh, being involved with the Safety Act, and it was kind of focused on uh, entertainment and sports venues. And um, what's happened over the years is, is we've seen there's been kind of a broader application to this. Um, there's a lot of good material in there, and there's a lot of specifics that relate to um, mail rooms and mail security. So we're going to just cover a few of those as a as a highlight, and then uh, provide you that material as well at the end of this presentation. But you know, they they a few of the things that they've mentioned, and, and I've been uh, talking to folks for years about this. And keep in mind, with these, these aren't always easy to implement. You may not be able to do all of them. You may be able to do one or two, and that would at least you know move the, the ball a little bit further down the field. So if you're able to isolate your receiving areas to a specific mail room or loading dock only where everything comes in, that would be something good that you could possibly go ahead and do uh, at this point. You know, verifying uh, who is dropping off deliveries specific to maybe couriers, private couriers who are often come in plain clothes, a lack of ID, they show up and drop something off, you know, getting positive identification on those types of individuals, maybe utilizing some surveillance equipment. Um, and if you do, making sure that it can adjust for various environmental conditions, you know, like uh, low light, uh, various distance uh, constraints that you may have, vibrations within the building, you know, especially in industrial areas, things like that uh, can be important whenever you're setting up these, these security protocols. Um, you know, and other things that we've heard for years, right, like reducing accessories to your mailroom that are security risk. If you have a postal drop box that's an unsecured lobby and somebody can just walk in and drop an item off into this drop box, that could be a security concern that you want to take a look at, right? And then the, the normal stuff like establishing HVAC zones that are separate from the rest of the building that you can shut off to try to mitigate some of these millborne threats. There is always nice if you're possibly building out something new or maybe doing some uh, work that allows you to accommodate those types of considerations. Uh, just a few more of these best uh, practices to take a look at. Um, one thing that you can do, and, and this is, you know, I find this often possible just due to physical layout, is just shifting things around. So if your mail room uh, can be moved due into an area that maybe is some unused space, you may want to consider that, especially when you're trying to keep it away from, you know, main entrances and areas containing any sort of critical infrastructure, uh, utilities, distribution systems, or any other important asset, right? Uh, locating it offside or off the perimeter of a building, um, if you can do that, not always possible, right? But that's a good thing to take a look at as well. You know, lim limiting delivery times during peak hours. Again, not always easy, but if you can kind of limit the exposure to, you know, your highest volume of guests or employees, that is always something that, that we, were, you know, we recommend when possible. Other things like, you know, uh, making sure everything gets screened, right? We're not going to let things slip through just because we're used to having it done one way or, you know, FedEx shows up at, a, at another desk or, or welcome center, and that's just where it's been dropped off previously. If we can funnel all that to one location, make sure everything gets screened and nothing bypasses the screening process, that's going to be something important. You know, training people on suspicious mail and what to do if they come across suspicious mail. What does that response look like? Making sure all of your folks know. And then something just as easy as implementing PPE um, outside of the, the threats and dangers involved with, with mail and people sending stuff they shouldn't. You know, mail's just gross anyways, so it's not a bad idea just to have that on hand for general hygiene with the side bonus of, hey, it could protect you from some sort of biological or chemical and things of that nature. So, again, these are just some of the things that we can do and roll into our SOPs to kind of help improve uh, where we're sitting and where our standards are at a current time. And that's it, TJ. 
Thank you very much, Cody. There's obviously a lot of information in there. Uh, as a reminder, we will be sending around these slides and a number of other uh, assets and, and material after the fact, uh, so you can read through some of this uh, you know, on your own time afterward. Uh, and again, one more reminder, we do have a number of questions coming in. Thank you uh, all for submitting those. They're great questions, and we will get to them uh, at the end of the presentation. But our last segment for the afternoon will come from Dr. Alexander Sapok, and he'll take us through the screening technologies, uh, advanced technologies to counter today's threats. Alex? Great, thanks, TJ. So, um, you know, it's no, no uh, coincidence that the technology piece here is at the end of the presentation. And we've heard from Will around the statistics, you know, the prevalence of mail threats, the type of mail threats, uh, some of the historical data from USPIS and other government sources. Uh, we heard from Cody about, you know, how we structure processes and procedures for our enterprise to deal with those sort of threats from a, from a process standpoint uh, and a personnel standpoint. Uh, so at the end of the day, technology really is a, another tool. It's a mechanism to allow us to accomplish those tasks. And the first step in selecting the proper tool uh, or understanding the tool kit that we need to build out to deal with these is to really understand the kind of threats that um, our organizations are faced with. And as we heard a bit from Will at the beginning of the presentation, these threats have evolved over the years. So 20, 30 years ago, things like large explosive devices, uh, dangerous items, guns, knives, et cetera, contraband, you know, they just tended to be the most prevalent types of, of threats that folks were concerned with. That's evolved now to you know smaller and smaller amounts of more and more dangerous powders and liquids, you know things like fentanyl, other drugs, ricin. We heard a little bit about, uh, and a number of hoaxes right coming through these sort of means. Certainly, this can encompass all manner of chemical and biological uh, agents. So, if we look at you know these these range of threats in particular, it's important to understand, you know, what sort of threats, you know, are we, do we need to be prepared to handle? And then what are the right tools uh, for the task as well? And, and we'll spend some time in this, the rest of the talk kind of going through uh, those options. Um, the other important piece that we want to keep in mind when we think about selecting the tool uh, is really what do we need it to do at the end of the day? And I want to spend a little bit of time sort of clearing up a common misconception around detection versus identification. So we can think about a simple example. If we look at security camera footage, we might be able to see two people in that footage. So we've detected the presence of two people, but we may not yet be able to identify them. We might not know their names, who they are, where they're from, what they're doing. Um, so it's important to, to separate out, you know, what do we really need to do with these tools? And when it comes to dangerous mail, oftentimes from a corporate or enterprise standpoint, detection followed by isolation uh, is really often the most effective means. And then the identification piece, really determining what kind of powder it is. Is it anthrax? Is it ricin? Is it something more benign? Can be left to law enforcement or, you know, the, the folks that are trained and have that expertise and that type of equipment to do that analysis. So really, when we start to look at imaging technologies that we can implement in our organizations on a daily basis, we'll spend some time here really focusing on the detection technologies, uh, specifically around visual detection, to see these items so that we can isolate them uh, and then deal with them appropriately in accordance with the policies and procedures that uh, Cody talked about. Uh, the first thing we want to take a look at uh, is sort of reference back to uh, the USDHS guidelines uh, around best practices for mail screening. Uh, so this table comes from those guidelines, and it really illustrates both the range of mail threats on the left-hand side and then the various you know, common approaches to uh, trying to screen or, or trying to detect those threats. The interesting thing that you'll see is you know, basic visual approaches um, show up for nearly all of those threats. Now, visual screening can be effective at looking you know, at the exterior of the mail item, but when it comes to figuring out what's inside, we quickly run into problems. So the only way to really visually screen for that is to open it up, and if it's a threat, certainly you know, that, that causes some problems. On the other hand, then you ask yourself, okay, what other you know, tools and techniques are, are available for seeing inside so I can visually inspect inside the mail item without actually opening it? And there today, you know, the most common tool is x-ray. And as you can see in the chart here, you know, x-ray is well suited for uh, imaging large items, explosives, dangerous items. But again, when it comes to the chemical, biological items, the powders, things that make up a lot of the hoaxes, particularly in small quantities, uh, we have a mismatch between a lot of the common tools out there today and the type of threats that we need to be able to detect uh, within our organizations. 
Uh, and that is not just specific to the U.S. guidelines. We can look at um, you know, guidelines in the U.K. as well. We've got the uh, U.K. mail screening standards here, uh, PAS 97, explicitly, again, calling attention to the fact that, you know, some of these newer and more, more prevalent threats, the white powder incidents uh, we hear about on an ongoing basis are often undetectable with typical uh, technology screening means. Um, so with that kind of background, we can then start to think about, okay, what other tools and techniques are out there uh, to allow us to do this inspection sort of non-invasively and not put ourselves at risk? So when it comes to imaging, um, it's important to kind of you know, understand what types of imaging approaches we have at our disposal. The type of imaging that we're all familiar with, visual imaging, it's the way we see the world. Our eyes are, are great optical sensors in that means. Um, we, we see uh, because either light reflects or transmits through different surfaces. And those are really the two predominant forms that we see things. We perceive the world around us. So we see a car driving down the street because the light is reflecting off of that car. Um, we see something you know, outside of our building because we're transmitting, we're, we're looking through the window, we're seeing that transmitted image through, through that window, for example. But we can extend that kind of basic understanding to other applications. I think you're probably all familiar with medical ultrasound imaging, right? using acoustics, a form of sound waves, to look at a reflected signal or a transmitted signal and then generate an image, for example, of you know, somebody's heart beating uh, using uh, ultrasound. So other forms of imaging. And then we can take this sort of basic concept and extend it even further across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And that's what this sort of cartoon is showing here. Um, a simple way to think about the electromagnetic spectrum is really, you know, if we start at the left-hand side, uh, we're looking at the wavelength um, or the you know, kind of the, the size of that squiggly line, right? It's uh, going from very long waves, things like radio waves, to very uh, short wavelength, like x-rays or, or, or radiation. Uh, and as we go up in, um, uh, across the spectrum, we go up in frequency, the wavelength uh, decreases. Uh, as humans, you know, we spend most of our time in this tiny little sliver in the middle of the spectrum, the physical, visible spectrum, right? And that's, that's what we're seeing with our eyes. Um, but as we kind of step away from that and we look across the spectrum, we can quickly see that opens the door to a number of other imaging approaches. Uh, the one other thing I just wanted to call out with this, um, this uh, illustration here is the fact that as we kind of go uh, up in frequency or down in wavelength, as we move to the right from the visible spectrum, we get into the ionizing regime. So we're all familiar with, you know, ultraviolet rays from the sun being harmful for us. You know, we can always subject ourselves to so and so many uh, medical x-rays every year. Ionizing radiation, the wavelength is small enough, the energy is high enough, it interacts with the atoms, the molecules in our body, it can affect their DNA and, and cause uh, harm. Uh, on the other hand, if we go uh, down in frequency, we go to the larger wavelengths, the radio waves, microwaves, et cetera, we get out of the ionizing regime and we're in a safer, uh, safer regime. So we can then um, sort of look at the same spectrum, uh, but put it in the context of different types of imaging that we may be familiar with. Uh, and again, if we start at the left-hand side here, sort of the longer wavelengths, we've got things like sonar imaging. And you can see kind of a picture of a ship here at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, ultrasound imaging that we talked about, medical ultrasound. As we continue to move up in frequency, so the wavelengths are getting shorter uh, and smaller, um, we've got things like terahertz imaging, very new form of non-invasive imaging, and that's what we'll, we'll spend the rest of the presentation on. But you can see when we go beyond terahertz, we've got things like infrared imaging or thermal imaging. And then we get into the visible and certainly the x-ray on the ionizing side that we're all familiar with as well. So when we're talking about imaging, oftentimes the easiest way is actually see an example. Um, and when it comes to terahertz imaging, a uh, couple of the unique aspects of that approach is, first of all, the, effect, the, the fact that it's non-ionizing. Um, so it's safe, you can interact with items, um, and it provides a real-time view through the item, very similar to x-ray, but at much, low power, much lower power levels, again, in a non-ionizing manner, uh, so that we can interact with that. So I think we'll have a small video that uh, should pop up on uh, each of your screens here momentarily. Um, and what this video shows is you can see somebody's hands in the corner of the frame, holding a box. This is an empty box. You, you wouldn't be able to see through this with your eyes, but we're holding it in the field of view of a terahertz imaging system. So you're able to see right through it. 
So if there was an item inside of this box, a weapon, some powder, some liquids, right, we would be able to see that. And because it's dynamic, you can see it from all angles, you sort of have a 3D perspective. It's very intuitive um, to, to use this sort of an imaging approach. So you can imagine this kind of imaging is really, it's the same way that, you know, we interact with items in our everyday life. If we pick up a package or a box, we don't know what's behind it. You just turn it over with your hands. And you look at the back side of it. Same kind of approach here, um, now being able to see through and inside of items. Um, a couple of things when it comes to terahertz imaging, it's sort of the last frontier in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it's the, sort of the, the final portion of that spectrum that really hasn't been well developed. If you start on the right-hand side of this image here, you've got sort of this orange optical area. So that's the X-ray imaging, um, you know, visible light, et cetera. You know, those technologies have been around for over 100 years. Uh, on the left-hand side, you kind of got the blue part of this uh, plot here. The electrical side, things like radio waves, microwaves, you know, we've, that technology has been around for a long time. But terahertz, because it sits right in the middle, historically, it's been very difficult to develop technologies that generate terahertz signals and can also detect and see them. So over the last 20 years or so, the terahertz imaging has predominantly been developed for things like satellite uh, and space communications and imaging applications, uh, but more recently has seen increased use for, for security. And again, as we saw in that video, um, a big part of that reason is the fact that it's safe to use, right? It's non-ionizing, and you have that dynamic direct feedback uh, that it's hard to get with other types of uh, imaging technologies. So specifically when it comes to screening mail uh, and other uh, security items, there's a couple other examples here of terahertz images. Uh, on one hand, you've got conventional threats, things like a gun or a weapon inside of a package. Um, you've got other examples here of a small amount of liquid or powder uh, in an envelope. In this case, these are very, very small levels. So in the liquid, you kind of see these dark areas in the middle of the screen. If you saw the video, if you saw this in motion, you'd actually see the liquid sort of sloshing around in these little packets embedded in the envelope. The same here goes for the powder, where you'd see the grains of powder sort of moving in the envelope um, in the field of view. And in this case, less than 100 milligrams, uh, it's about a crushed uh, tablet of aspirin, for example. So, you know, these are, uh, wanted to introduce some of these new and more innovative imaging approaches that, you know, can be the right tool for the right job uh, when it comes to uh, mail screening for these specific applications. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, technology is very useful. These tools are useful. Uh, they provide certain information, but uh, we still require humans to interpret that information and act on it. So having people that are properly trained, going back to you know, reinforce the standard operating procedures that Cody talked about, uh, knowing how to make use of that information and act on it is just as important. And then finally, I'll just close um, by saying that, you know, all these tools are great. They're, they provide us additional and more effective detection means that are, you know, tailored for specific threats. But at the end of the day, often, you know, the best security is preventing the threats before they occur. So when we think about implementing mail security and technology as part of that, um, one thing to keep in mind is making it a very overt security program. Uh, the reason mail is often used as a means of uh, threat here is because people know it's not being screened, and often that comes from insiders. So these are people within the organization, disgruntled employees or customers or other partners that are close to the organization, um, and they know that mail is an easy way in. So if you're making it part of an overt security program, the mail is being stamped as it's going through security screening, people know that it's being screened, you start to take away that threat vector and make it much less uh, successful, and you start to prevent those threats before they even occur. So lastly, just to, uh, to conclude, um, you know, for the three panelists that we had um, uh, today, we talked about the problem, you know, the extent, the prevalence of the problem, um, understanding what are the most likely threats, um, and then the solutions that we can implement uh, to do so. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back. Um, I think we got some minutes for a few minutes for Q and A, and um, we'll open up the floor. So uh, again, thank you everyone for submitting these questions. Please do keep them coming in. Uh, the first one I wanted to put to the panel here uh, came from uh, a attendee today. It asks, if you receive a letter that isn't addressed to anyone in particular and has no return address, should it be opened or should it be discarded? Uh, so Will, you talked about chain of custody. You talked about generic threats. Do you want to hop in on, on what the protocol should be there? 
Yeah, that's where, where common sense kind of leans in. I'm going to ask Cody in a minute because his background is a postal inspector. <laughs> um, it's where you should t really take a look at it and go, is this does it look legitimate? Uh, a lot of things show up without a return address on it. Lawyers, anybody that doesn't want you to necessarily, they don't want to, they want to put out the, who they're sending stuff to. There's a legitimate reason not to do it. Um, Cody, what do you think about that? Because it's. Yeah, on, on anything like that, I would I would not open that, especially if it's if it, there's no return address and it's just maybe it's addressed to a title or uh, something like HR. You know, that's a definite indicator that something's not right. Um, I would, at my personal opinion, that would be one where I would call probably the postal inspectors because, again, my experience leads me to believe that if, if somebody's sending something like that and maybe it's just a threatening letter, right? They're looking for a specific response. If they do not get the the outcome that they're looking for. You know, it's it's we I've seen it often where next time it may be uh, a white powder or something uh, worse than that. So we want to make sure that we're even just keeping a record of threatening letters, you know, any sort of eccentric mailings and starting to build profiles out on on these type of things in case it ever escalates and uh, an investigation needs to come out of it. That's a good point. Thinking ahead about what kind of after that uh, that letter. Uh, next question here is, uh, would you also include the screening of freight from a trusted provider? Uh, a shipment of, let's say, computer monitors or something, the fact that it comes from a known uh, company, how does that affect chain of custody and the screening that would be involved? And again, I think that'd be for you, Cody. Yeah, on incidents like that, you know, if it's coming from a, a known sender, we know what, what it is, we're expecting it. You know, if it, it comes in on a pallet and maybe it's shrink wrapped or something of that nature, there's no tampering that's going on. That has a much lower likelihood of being something that needs to be screened. Things like that. It would receive very little scrutiny from me. Um, visual, you know, you're taking a good look at it. Everything looks like it should. Uh, we're probably going to go ahead and bring that in. It's if at any point there's some sort of uh, visual clue that makes you think, hey, this this has been tampered with or it, not, it doesn't normally come this way, then we want to go into it a little bit deeper. And on something like that, I would probably just call a center and ask them, hey, this showed up looking like this. Is it supposed to look like this? If they say, no, it's not, then that would give you reason to look into the incident a little bit further. Excellent. Uh, I have two questions for Alex. Uh, the first one just came in. Uh, it says, a question about terahertz imaging devices. How available are they to the commercial market uh, with you know the, the types of technology you've described uh, in your presentation, Alex? Yep, um, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to highlight this new imaging technique is they are now, uh, you know, broadly available, um, and the technology has progressed to the point that um, because of some of its benefits, the fact that it's non-ionizing, you know, something in the size and form factor that looks like an office copy machine, um, it can essentially be deployed as a scanner uh, in anything from a mailroom to a warehouse to a reception desk to do this kind of screening. Um, so it really opens the door if you think, you know, it's a bit of an archaic analogy, but if you think back to, you know, the early days of copy machines with the GEs and the Xeroxes, you know, large corporations having access to this large equipment, uh, this is now progressing to the point where it can be easily deployed. Uh, maybe not to the extent that you go to Best Buy and buy an all-in-one printer, uh, but it's trending in that direction. Excellent. And then sort of playing off of that, a question comparing terahertz imaging to X-ray. Uh, does X-ray pick up threats like liquids and powders? And the question here asks, if not, why do people use them? Uh, you know, not to take away from X-ray, it does have its place, but maybe the comparison between X-ray and terahertz and their abilities to detect. What can you speak to there? Yeah, so the key there is going back to the fact that, you know, these technologies, they're, they're all tools. They're different tools in a toolbox, um, and they're all, you know, have pros and cons in terms of you know, the task that they're they're applied to. So something like X-ray, it's higher energy, right? And we saw that in the spectrum. It's it's on the, the, the right side. It's ionizing radiation. X-ray is great for penetrating thick items, you know, penetrating metal, uh, imaging at a relatively high resolution through those types of items. Um, so it definitely has its place in security screening, uh, no doubt. Um, on the other hand, end of, end of the spectrum, things like liquids and powders, sort of soft items, right? They can you can sort of easily blast through them with X-ray, so it's sort of like overexposing a film. You sort of wash those out uh, in a way, and so that's where something that's lower energy, like terahertz scanning, uh, comes in and can be very useful to both you know see the the types of guns and knives and things that you would see with traditional X-ray, uh, but also to be able to pick up those liquids and powders and those softer items that you might not be able to see with those conventional tools. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. And uh, being aware of time, I think we might have time for two more questions here. I'm going to throw this one over to Will. Uh, as a CSO, it's a question about security policy. Uh, we mentioned stamping envelopes to indicate that they've been scanned. That would be, you know, applied by mailroom personnel uh, or, you know, anyone kind of in a facilities role. But as a security policy, what is your opinion on if an organization should openly communicate the fact that mail is being screened, openly communicate that to employees uh, so they know ahead of time that, you know, that this is going on? That's a fantastic idea. Um, it's a hardened target. It's, it's always harder to hit somebody who's prepared and even the perception of doing something more than the rest of the group. Uh, just like in you know, the wild world of the animals, they're gonna pick the slowest one. If you've got the hardened uh, outside, you can make sure people are aware of what you're doing. That's a fantastic win. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a relatively easy fix, too. Yeah, uh, and then little. lastly, uh, there are two questions here about the DHS uh, documents and uh, targeted industries. One question was about the source of uh, that list of most targeted industries. Uh, that is available on our documentation that will be sent around to you. It is the DHS best practices guidelines. Again, we'll be able to get you a link to that. Uh, but on that top targeted industries, um, the question about what are the what are those industries and is it specific to countries and how does the kind of trend data apply and i might highlight uh will the report that you uh just highlighted you can see on the screen here our 2020 report uh annual report that's about to be released uh can you speak to the countries and industries and trends that you've seen uh and how you know kind of dhs is, is there a gap or overlap there between the uh the top industries they recommend uh between the countries so it, again that goes back to hard and target it depends on what people are doing and vice what they're not doing. So uh, Canada has been getting hit heavily this year with white powder events uh, all through, you know, just about every major industry. I showed you the Netherlands earlier. Um, that's not just stuck in the Netherlands. I picked that one. Places you don't see it is, you know, where they have a very robust screening program. Uh, U UK was not hit very hard this year. They had a few events, but it wasn't as bad as other locations. Uh, it gets down to how you look at threats. Uh, most people don't wake up in the morning and think, I'm just going to, you know, not deal with these threats today. They want to get after it, but it's not something that people actively go after to solve. And that's usually where the problem lies. And then we did have one sneak under the wire here. Again, I recognize time. I want to be aware, but real quickly, can you speak to anything, Will, on policies of the uh, the third party, you know, shipping uh, major labels that we talk about, uh, of any yeah. security screening protocols that you know of for them? You know, I don't necessarily need to name names here, but the USPS seems a little different from the third parties. Yeah. Can you speak to that difference at all? Yeah, third parties are a private courier. So they, most times when you, for example, get drugs turned in through, pick one of them, you've used them. It's because the individual that's taking that package in behind the counter sees something that makes them question it. They open the package, they call the police. Uh, that's a very common reaction because they don't want to get caught with it, obviously. Uh, the USPS has got their forms and standards in place to what they do, um, but there's only so much that anybody can do. Ultimately, the problem is it ends up on the lap of our clients or on the lap of your people, and the reality is there's nobody that's really checked a lot of that between A and B. And it ends up being on the on the hands of the individual at the receiving end. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, all right. So there are a few other uh, questions in here that I'm not sure we'll have time for this afternoon. Uh, thank you for submitting those questions. We will be able to follow up and answer those that uh, that need it. So please do feel free to reach out to us. And we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and again, thank you all for joining us.